This is the Puck Poolies Podcast with Matt Larkin and Stephen Ellis. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Puck Poolies Podcast. It's Matt Larkin here with my pal, Stephen Ellis. This is episode four of our show. I can't believe we're already four episodes in. And of course, we're brought to you by ProLine Plus. So, Stephen, let's launch in as always. What's going on in your fantasy league, my friend? Well, I'm right now 11 1 and 0 uh, with, in my league. I uh, doubled up on the team that I played against uh, that did not have a good week, mostly because they forgot to, you know, put. Nathan McKinnon in the lineup when he got called back into the lineup, but that's okay. I'll take it. Uh, this week, I'm already off to a good start. Uh, I'm actually in the process of trying to make a trade. I'm trying to potentially trade JT Miller. Uh, we'll see if that works out. Uh, it's to a guy that I hope doesn't listen to this podcast as I make fun of him for it, but uh, uh, it's more of just like, you know, he's, he's a good, uh, he can play center left wing right wing, so he's got value there. Clearly, he's not really producing, and who knows what's going to happen there in Vancouver. So I'm trying to just see if I can just kind of pawn him off and then bring in someone else some other way. But uh, doing first, I'm first place. No one is even close to me. Uh, I am projected to lose this week, but I think that will change. And it's, so this Miller trade, it's not like an emotional trade. It's not because you just don't like the way he's behaving. It's just purely for fantasy reasons. It, it's I was because he's a can't cut player. Uh, I was kind of hesitant to take him in the first place. I don't like having a lot of those can't cut guys. And obviously you're going to get guys like Dreisaitl and Shesterkin and guys like that that will have that. But the fact that these can't cut means I would rather put someone in who could produce a bit more. And honestly, I've been trying to trade him since the start of the season. For that right, and in the shallow league. league. That makes sense. Yeah, and yeah. part of it is like I wish I had I, – I, I, my right wing depth is terrible. I have a lot of left wings and not a lot of right wings. He could play right wing, but I'd rather have someone who can actually produce on the right wing. In, in theory so i kind of need someone who could just do a bit better so okay that. okay well glad you're in first place i'm in still fighting i'm i'm tied for fourth place but also in ninth place because of the divisional seating and it's a weird controversy in our league where there's one team that's tanking like he's on pace to destroy the all-time futility record he's something like 50 points 50 points below 15th place and he's 16th place and it's creating a problem because our schedule we have four divisions and you get to play your own division three times and get to play other opponents once. So every team that's playing this guy is just rocketing up the standings and getting the records padded. And you have all these other teams that are actually better teams, like in my division, that are we're all 500. And you're going to get one of those teams only getting into the playoffs. And then they're going to upset one of these fake good teams that has an inflated record. So we're having all these debates of whether about whether we can still have tanking of this magnitude because it's legitimately messing up the standings. It's basically a free win if you get to face this team. So teams not in his division, we're like, well, we only get to face him once. So it's kind of, uh, we're having trouble figuring it out, but we're, we're working on it. Um, so let's let's launch into some pickups, Stephen. What do you got? All right. Let's start, as usual, with the shallow league pickup of the week. And we're going to Arturi Lekkinen, a guy that was a Montreal Canadiens player, went over to the Colorado Avalanche, made a big impact there, and he's also a good fantasy player. That's right. As of Monday night, he was available in 40% of leagues. Uh, we know, of course, Nathan McKinnon is back, as you referenced already, Stephen. Gabriel Landeskog, Valerie Nishushkin are still not back, which means Lekkonen just has no competition for that first line left wing job. The Avalanche have been loading up that line with Lekkonen, McKinnon, and Miko Rantanen, and they're playing an absurd amount of minutes. So right now, Lekkonen is sixth, I believe, or at least he was going into Monday, sixth among NHL forwards in average time on ice, 21-16, and that went up after last night's game as well. I think he played 24 minutes. McKinnon played like 27 minutes. Colorado is just letting those guys carry. That line is just carrying them. So the opportunities are just so plentiful for Arturi Lekkonen, who, of course, started the year hot. He got banged up. Uh, but right now... His shooting percentage is just in a real cold spell, a really unlucky spell. Going into Monday, it was like almost 5% his shooting percentage in, in the past eight games. So there's some serious positive regression coming. He did have a couple assists Monday, but I do think the goals are going to come back too in a big way. Uh, so I'm surprised. I think this is a pretty valuable fantasy player to be available in almost half of Yahoo Leagues. This one is an interesting one because it's not just one player. It's multiple and it's the LA Kings trio of I follow Dino and Arvidsson. Why do you like those guys? Yeah, I decided to just get a little outside the box. So we know, of course, last year the really dominant line was Trevor Moore, not Alex Ayafalo, on that spot with Philip Dino, Victor Arvidsson. Right now, Trevor Moore's out. I believe it's going to be at least another week. So Ayafalo can be subbed into that spot. They're available, respectively, Ayafalo, 93% of leagues, uh, Philip Dino, 69%. 
and Victor Arvidsson, 73%. So they right now have just found their stride. We know the Kings have heated up and that line, even without Trevor Moore is starting to play it the way it was last year. It's a big play driving line. So of course that means more value in real life, but even in fantasy, Lines that are great play drivers are very valuable in shots leagues. So, so Dano Arvidsson, they're really piling up lots of shots. They're just they just have the puck all the time, and we know the points are coming as well. Victor Arvidsson eight points in his last six games. Philip Dano nine in his last seven. So, I don't know if you want to ride Al Fal- for too long because that spot is probably temporary for him. But at the very least, Dano and Arvidsson are really nice short, medium, maybe even long term pickups because of the way they're playing. They seem to have rediscovered their groove. It just took them a while. I had Victor Arvidsson in my own league. I just sat on him. I figured he's too good to stay this down for this long. He gets so many chances, and they're finally starting to click. So I think that entire line can help you right now. Arvidsson was always my sneaky like pickup guy I like to make every year, and I haven't done it in a while, but I actually took a look at him this morning. So, okay, interesting. Uh, speaking of a guy that I think is quite interesting and maybe the most obscure player to appear on the, the uh, deep league pickup, but he's playing so well right now. And it's Michael Amadio from the Vegas Golden Knights. That's right. And I picked him for that reason. I thought, why are we talking about Mike Amadio? I feel like we never will again. So this is a like a Loch Ness monster sighting. We have to do it. Uh, and I, I chose him last night as I was preparing for this show, and he scored again last night. So he's been playing on the first line with Chandler Stevenson and Mark Stone. Of course, Vegas is a bit decimated by injuries. And he's been lighting it up. After the goal Monday night, he's got five goals and nine points in his last seven games. Mike Amadio, where is this coming from? He's 26 years old. But one thing I always say on fantasy shows, I've always said it, is I always look at players and whether they pass the score at every level test. So the example I always use is I didn't trust Andrew Kopp because he never even scored 30 goals, I think, in, even in junior. Uh, but Mike Amadio is the opposite. He has scored everywhere he's played before the NHL. He had 50 goals in his last season of Major Junior. He has been roughly a point-per-game player in the AHL. So then you have to wonder, okay, this guy does have scoring touch. What if it's just a matter of him never getting the opportunity to spread his wings in a bigger role? Maybe he does have the hands to sustain this for a little while. I don't know if it's going to last forever, but I do think it's at least worth a short-term pickup, ride that wave, and just see how long it can last because he seems to have discovered something right now. So this is kind of where you like – when I originally, when you originally came up with the idea of the WTF pickup, this is the type of player I would think, but no, because the meaning of it is more of like, why aren't people picking this guy up? But for Amadio, looking at his stats, this is a guy who's actually just been just on fire. He had a three-point game. He's had a bunch of points in the last couple of games, like you mentioned. So why not? Okay, I like that pick. That's very off the board. But let's go to the WTF pickup. And it's uh, going to Edmonton for uh, Stuart Skinner. And again, Edmonton's goaltending situation never – seems to be a boring thing. Uh, Miko Koskinen, by the way, has been pretty good in the Swiss League. Not that that matters. But uh, what are your thoughts here on Stuart Skinner? Yeah, and it's it's interesting the way you put it. It never seems to be boring with goalies in Edmonton. I think maybe that's why Stuart Skinner is somehow still available in 31% of leagues. But to me, I'm kind of wondering if this battle with Jack Campbell is over. Uh, Skinner has started six of the past eight games, seven of the past ten. He has a 917 save percentage. And going into Monday, among goalies with at least 20 games played, that was the eighth best in the NHL. So among starting goaltenders, he stops the eight most pucks in terms of just the efficiency, the save percentage. Can't really get much better than that in terms of trying to decide the winner between him and Jack Campbell. I don't know if there's much of a debate anymore. We see Jack Campbell's ownership level has really plummeted, but I don't see Skinner's ownership level rising in a way that's consistent with the drop for Jack Campbell. To me, Stuart Skinner should be at least... I think owned in 80% of leagues, not 69% of leagues right now, uh, just because of the fact he is now pretty much the starter on a team that does have playoff aspirations. Yes, the Oilers have those questions defensively, but this, the 917 state percentage suggests that Stuart Skinner is able to weather that storm and the opportunities for wins are going to be there, even saves or shots if your league counts those volume categories. So I just think it's time to, to take the plunge on Stuart Skinner. You mentioned the saves and shots. Uh, for my league, we do track saves, which I'm not sure I loved, but then that made goalies extremely valuable. And I think I, I was the first one to really notice that in my league. And that has been very helpful. And I've got really good goaltending as a result where I was, even though I set the league up, I wasn't actually aware of the saves being part of it. And I went and picked a ton of goalies early just because I wanted to make sure at the best. And it's really worked out. Uh, it's honestly one of the reasons why I'm, I'm dominating the pool on it because goalies have been good for saves. So sometimes... 
when you, when your your team is going out there and outscoring teams seven to five or seven to three, you're still getting a lot of shots at games, but you're also scoring a lot. You can take advantage of the wins, the saves, everything in that case. Um, obviously, that's not how you want to play hockey. You don't want to have to always win seven to five, but sometimes it happens. Mm-hmm. And for this week, this one, this is a tip that I really needed to hear because I, I keep falling into this trap. It's uh, about depth. And what, what, do, what do I mean by that? What do you mean by that? Yeah, so there can be a trap you fall into where you're just trying to build a good team and you want to be able to stare at your roster and feel good about every single player and say, he's good, he's good, he's good. Every single guy is a solid player. My team is great top to bottom. But that can sort of paint you into a corner. And sometimes, especially, this is a this is a tip, by the way, that applies more to head-to-head than anything else. But when you're playing head-to-head, you need to have some roster flexibility. You want to be able to play your opponent, especially if later in the week you're close in certain categories. You want to be able to have someone you can drop anytime you want, just so you can sub in that guy that's going to get you a few hits or a few blocks, whatever it is. If your team is loaded with players that just are those brand names that you're afraid to drop, you can't do that. So for example, what if you have a team that's all scorers? You have so many players that are just reliable sources of points. Every one of them has a history of being a pretty good fantasy player. You're losing hits every week. And there's some weeks where you're close, but you're, you think, oh, I can't drop whatever. Mikhail Granlund, because he's a name that's been around for a long time. I can't drop him. He's a name. I can't drop Ryan Johansson, someone like that, right? And it prevents you from being able to pick up a Mike Amadio type of player, someone who's on a bit of a heater or someone that can help you target a certain category, whether it's hits, blocks, shots. So in my opinion, you you want to trade, let's say you have a couple of A- minus players, try and trade two A- minuses for an A+, plus. try and t- trade two B pluses for an A-, minus. even if it's a small upgrade, it's worth getting the great player for two good players, and then you have that little bit of roster flexibility. It's almost like you want a couple bums on your team, because then you have no emotional attachment to them, and you can use that spot to target categories. And in my own league, I make by far the most moves, because I do this, and it annoys people, because I'm churning, just churning over that waiver wire at all times. I think I have like 20 more moves than the next closest team but it's crucial and it actually can flip categories and win you some matches so don't get too deep if your team has no flexibility you want to trade a couple of guys for maybe one guy so just looking at my center depth when everyone's healthy i have tage thompson elias Pettersson, uh leon dreisaitl and jack eichel now of course again my league is small so it makes it so i can have all this power but then i just lose out on points or i'm like i might have to sit tage thompson tonight i might have to sit like a star player and it's like that's a tough spot which is uh kind of the funny thing because the guy i'm trying to trade with for jt miller is looking to try to get rid of some wingers and i need a right winger and uh kind of just need like, J- jt miller is great the fact that he is center left wing right wing uh i don't know how much right wing he's actually played but um he's someone where if i could pawn him off and maybe pick up a right winger because again, that's another centerman there. I also have a lot of left wing depth where I'm looking at potentially. I got Kappers off. I have Marshawn. Dryside could play left wing. I got Robertson. I got Hyman. I got Miller. And Pedersen plays left wing. Like, that's a lot of left wings. So mm-hmm. I got to kind of, I, I got to figure out how to kind of manage that a bit better. Yeah, especially in the league with a bench too, when you're forced to just be keeping quality players on your bench. And I usually filter things through the lens of the league I play and we don't have a bench you start your entire lineup every game but i think the depth thing maybe even applies more if you have a bench because then you're just keeping good players just if your roster doesn't have the right configuration or it's too deep you're forced to just leave good players on the bench all the time i have a league like that as well that we're playing in uh the one that frank cervelli and brock sagan and i are in where i have to sit maddie beneers every night because i just have too many centers so i'm thinking oh i'm just too deep i need to make a trade so don't get too deep on your team, even though it feels better to look at your team and think it seems cool because it has a lot of brand names. So, Stephen, I actually just mentioned Brock Sagan, our colleague at Daily Faceoff. He is our guest of the week, so let's go to Brock right now. Next up, we are very pleased to welcome, for the first time on the Puck Pooley podcast, but certainly not the last time, our colleague at the fantasy version of Daily Faceoff. It's, of course, Brock Sagan, the managing editor of Daily Face Off Fantasy, and of course, the host of DFO Fantasy Podcast. I consider him sort of the, the Gordie Howe of our website, the guy who's been there from the beginning, posting the best historical numbers. We even saw you tweet earlier today, Brock, about it being your 10-year anniversary. Congratulations and, and welcome to the show, buddy. 
Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, I think the one thing that's crazy about it, like being my 10 year anniversary is like, I really never thought you could write about fantasy hockey for a living. I never thought it would, it would get to this point. But uh, daily face offs grown so much over the years from it just being kind of me by myself. And it's grown to the point where we could add somebody like Frank Saravalli and then Mike McKenna, then you Matt and you Steven and it's it's been a, a wild ride, but it's been fun. Absolutely. And it's funny, when I first started a daily faceoff, anytime I would mention it to someone, you know, where are you working now? Daily faceoff, they'd say, Oh, the lines, the starting goalies. I love that site. I use it all the time. And to anyone who doesn't know this, Brock is the guy behind the lines and the goalies. He's the driving force. He's the one grinding every day, putting all those lineups together. So I wanted to just get a sense of your daily routine. I know it's pretty exhaustive what you have to do. So how many hours a day do you spend tracking every single line and lineup and starting goalie, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, my wife would be the first one to tell you that I pretty much have no free time during the hockey season. Um, you know, the most important thing is just being accurate, right? So I always try to go back and, and edit the lines from the night before in case there was any injuries or, or power play changes or anything like that. Um, so that's usually how my morning starts. And then morning skates start around 10 a.m. Eastern, usually go to 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, and then you get a little bit of a break there from team news, but then that's usually when I get my content in, try to, uh, I do my live DFS show in there. I, uh, I tell everybody who to start, who to sit, um, in terms of in between the pipes, injuries, all that stuff. Um, and that's, there's not much time off in between then and when morning skates or excuse me, warm up start at 6 30 PM Eastern. And depending on how many games there are, that could go to 10 PM Eastern. So, you know, a typical day for me is usually about 14 hours on my laptop with, with lines and news and starting goalies. And then, you know, I'm a fantasy player myself. I'm a DFS player. I'm a, I'm a better. So I'm watching hockey after that. So realistically for me, it's kind of eat, sleep and drink hockey all day, every day from the, you know, the moment the season starts till it ends. Now, maybe you'll be proud of me. Maybe you won't be, but I, I'm actually successfully in this podcast trying to trade JT Miller and it may have worked. And uh, that, that's a guy that I think everyone needs to get rid of right now. Anyways, um, so I guess because you stare at lines all day and you get to look at the starting goalies and you're always paying attention to what's going on there, do you get to use that as an advantage in your own fantasy hockey success? Um, yeah, I, I obviously it's been a huge edge over the years. I think the edge has probably decreased, you know, as the years progress because a lot of this stuff has become a lot more mainstream, right? Like daily faceoff was pretty small back in the day, but then now you even have like the sites like Yahoo putting the green check mark next to the goalies and stuff. So you don't, you know, have to be quite as on top of it as you used to be. But yeah, before, obviously I kind of knew some players that they were moving up the lineup or, or, you know, now on power play one that other people probably didn't know about. And, uh, you know, I was obviously really good at streaming goalies. If, if they were in an opportune, you know, spot start situation, I could pick them up pretty quickly and get them in my lineup. So um, yeah, definitely it's given me an edge, but it, it certainly diminished over the years with kind of how mainstream all just fantasy has become. So, Brock, I know all of us, I'm sure, have encountered these types of interactions before. But we know fantasy hockey players tend to be very passionate, especially when they have, you know, things like money involved in their games. I remember once being, when I was with the Hockey News, I was at a wedding and then there was a guy at my table who was angry that we removed the depth charts and he was on me all night. Like, come on, bring back the depth charts. So I'm curious for you, have you ever had any really strange interactions with readers or fans just over, you know, how soon the starting goalie was up, anything like that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's been lots of situations, uh, particularly like if a goalie is confirmed even by the coach and and then maybe he gets sick or he gets banged up in the morning ski and just doesn't end up starting. I typically get blamed for that. And I've tried to tell people over the years, like, you know, I really had nothing to do with that. Coach said he was starting. He's hurt now. I, I mean, I didn't control that. Unfortunately, um, he's not starting tonight. But yeah, those are the ones that are funny. But I try to be as accurate as possible. Um, you know, there's a lot of other Twitter accounts and stuff that maybe just kind of throw a green check mark on there to be the first one to confirm it or whatever. But I, I know how much money is at stake every single night on, you know, based on what I'm saying. So I try to be as thorough as possible and make sure that I'm not making those mistakes because it could cost somebody a lot of money if I, if I don't uh, get it right. So I've had a lot of those weird interactions where people get mad, but I think at the end of the day, it's kind of just uh, a, a little bit of a freak out. And then they're like, okay, yeah, it's probably, you know, not his fault, but I will say the best interaction I've ever had, um, it was when I was running the site by myself and uh, Bill Burr started talking about daily face off on his podcast. And I was mm -hmm. like, Oh my gosh, it's like, he's talking directly to me because it was just me. And he's like, I love the lines. So I'm like, this is pretty cool. So I actually had a chance to chat with him a little bit, went to one of his shows. So that was the best interaction, but there's definitely been some weird ones. 
that that's awesome. Uh, so this is a chance to maybe brag, um, but can you give me a player that you were extremely right about this year in fantasy, and then maybe one that you were very wrong about too? Yeah, you know, um, I, I went back and combed through my rankings yesterday, and uh, kind of to my surprise, I think I'm having a pretty good year. Um, some of the guys, like my my big thing coming into the season was to draft wingers, goalies, and defensemen early and wait on centers because the center pool is always so deep. And there were some names deeper in the draft that just didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. And four of those names that I really liked coming in were Braden Point, Rupe Hintz, Mark Shifley, and Tage Thompson. I had all four of those guys way ahead of their ADPs. And like I said, I was like draft wingers, draft goalies, draft D early, and you can fall back on these guys. And if you did, I mean, you know, Tage, obviously, I, know, I don't think anybody expected this. He's been insane, but Braden Point, Rupe Hintz, and Mark Shifley have all been really good as well. So those were, you know, that was my big philosophy coming in. And if people listened, it, it worked pretty well. Um, on my DFO fantasy podcast as well, I was very um, high on the sleeper potential of Eric Carlson. That one looks pretty good. Um, but as for as for getting things wrong, most of my issues, I think, have been between the pipes, which I'm usually okay with because it's so difficult to project on a year to year basis. Um, my sleeper goalie was Connor Hellebuck. So that feels good. Maybe offset some of the, the things I got wrong, but my main issue was probably with Alexander Georgiev. I just wasn't a hundred percent sold that he could be the guy in Colorado. I, I really liked Pavel Francouz as well. I thought that would be, you know, at worst a 50, 50 split and both would probably have a decent amount of value. I didn't really see this coming. Um, and then Thatcher Demko, I really thought, you know, my rankings had him pretty much at ADP, but I really thought he was like the breakout goalie this year um, and somebody that could take that next step. And boy, uh, I was wrong on that one for sure. I'm with you on that, Brock. I was very bullish <laughs> on Demko and I was also bearish on Georgiev. So you're not alone. Uh, I wanted to ask you lastly, before we let you go, what is your most important piece of all encompassing advice for a fantasy hockey player? Um, well, in the pre-draft process, I, I think the most important thing is to study the ADPs um, and really kind of get comfortable with them, especially if you have a few drafts um, on the same platform. And then whatever you're using in terms of rankings, really kind of cross-reference what the ADP in, in your rankings are so that you can kind of build that solid you know, platform in the first couple rounds and then really find value in the middle to late rounds. And if, if you do that, you're off to a good start. And then during the season, I think having a streaming spot is so important. Uh, we talk about it on our podcast every single week. I write about goalie streamers every single day on daily faceoff. Um, so maximizing your roster pickups, whether it's seven a week or whatever, making sure that you're maximizing those pickups, having a streaming spot, maximizing the amount of games that you can get. So uh, I write a strength of schedule article and streaming article every Monday and, and trying to maximize those pickups so that you can, um, you know, pick up guys that are playing on the lighter days, usually Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, and making sure you're not picking up a guy that's going to be sitting on your bench. So during the season, that is the most important because like, even if you're picking up guys that aren't that great, they might be able to chip in and, and really help you win a championship because if you maximize that roster spot, it's going to be worth more than having one guy kind of just sitting there. Absolutely. Well, that's some great insight, of course, from one of the best fantasy minds in the business. And Brock, before we let you go now, just give us a quick plug, a little self promo for your show, especially where and when to find it. Yeah. So the DFO fantasy podcast is usually released on Friday mornings. Uh, this week, it's actually going to be released tomorrow morning. Uh, we've got obviously commitments sometimes, but uh, yeah, usually Friday mornings, we do it once a week, uh, deep dive on, on pretty much everything, waiver wire pickups, buy and low uh, candidates, you name it. Um, and then the other thing I really like to promote is my DFO uh, DFS report. It's a live show I do on YouTube Monday through Friday, um, you know, breaking down the DFS slate. I have a really good tool that's 100% free that breaks down every single matchup at 5v5 and, and really gives you some good insight. And if, if you're not a DFS player, using the charts will definitely help you, you know, find good player props. Um, you know, even just find an edge in the game. We, we have pace of play. So you know, over-unders come into play there. So there's a lot of information that you can find and it's 100% free, which I'm really proud of being able to offer something that I think is great for, for free. Don't find that very often anymore. Absolutely. I agree, Brock. And thanks so much, man, for coming on. I'm sure we'll have you again, of course. We're working in this together in this biz, and uh, it's a pleasure having you, man. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, Stephen, best of luck pulling off that uh, JT Miller trade. I'm very close. I'm very <laughs> close. I think it might might happen in the next five minutes. As long as I don't click on Daily Face Off and find out that he's on the third line with Sheldon Dries now, you might be able to pull it off. Yeah. 
Well, that was awesome stuff from Brock. And now, Stephen, I want to turn the floor back over to you for the prospect update. Who are you watching closely right now? Well, I'm going with Jacob Pelche, uh, Calgary Flames prospect. Uh, he's 21 years old. He's a little undersized. He's 5'10", which obviously isn't that small, but he, he's not a very strong player. And I think that's part of the reason why he hasn't been called up to the NHL yet. Because if you look at his numbers, he had 82 points with the Moncton Wildcats in 2019-2020. He had 89 points the year before that. He, he had 61 points as a rookie, which was over a point per game. So this guy showed that he could produce at the junior level. He goes to the AHL last year, almost a point per game player. This year, he might get 80 points. This is a guy that just continues to produce. So why will the Calgary Flames not give him a chance? That's the biggest question, and you know, talking to, to Mike Gould, who works with us daily face-off and, and Flames Nation and everything, he, he's kind of like, wow, this guy deserves a chance. Watching him play with the Wranglers so much, he's a huge part of that team where um, you look at the Wranglers, and they got a lot of really good young guys, but you got to hope that they don't end up just becoming AHL for lifers, and it feels like that way because there's a lot of small guys that they're not giving a chance to. But I think if Pelche can get a chance in Calgary's top six, and I think if you're calling him up, you're throwing him in that role. That's what you're trying to do there. Uh, I think he'll start to produce because, you know, he's not great defensively, but he sees the ice well. Uh, he's a very good shooter, uh, and he's just as good of a playmaker. He makes players around him better, and I think if you put him out there and give him a chance in the top six in Calgary, I think he could produce and maybe become a full-time NHLer. I just think he needs that one chance. But when he gets called up, I wouldn't be surprised if he stayed up. They just got to make sure there's room for him. So we'll see if that happens. Yeah, it's just a matter of will Daryl Sutter, who's very old school, give him a chance. But it's funny, the way you describe Pelletier's game, he's a left winger, he can score, but he can set people up, make others around him better. It sounds kind of like the way people would have described Johnny Gaudreau before he broke into the NHL. Johnny Gaudreau wasn't a first round pick, Pelletier was. He was, right? Yeah. Um, but the scouting report, it kind of, I don't know, I see some parallels there. So. And we know that Johnny Gaudreau was able to have the best season of his career with Daryl Sutter. So that sort of dispelled the myth that a small guy can't play on a Daryl Sutter team. So you never know. Maybe there could be some surprise chemistry there. So let's move on, Stephen, to our best bet segment presented by ProLine Plus. I'm excited for my bet today because it's really obscure, but I think it's free money, baby. Uh, first, a little bit about our sponsor, of course, ProLine Plus. Uh, if you're not familiar with the way it's configured right now, it's the only sports book that gives all of its profits back to the Ontario government. So if you like knowing where your money goes and knowing that it helps something to do with your government services, that's what you're doing if you're playing ProLine Plus. It's your local trusted sports brook for over 30 years now offering Ontario sports fans more ways to play in-store, online, or take the game on the go with ProLine app. With your favorite sports and events right at your fingertips, download the ProLine app and bet in app with ProLine Plus today or head over to ProLinePlus.ca to learn more. Okay, well, I headed over to ProLine Plus, and I found a bet that I think is just free money. I can't believe this bet's allowed, so thank you, ProLine. Uh, <laughs> it's the relegation round, Stephen. This one's for you, buddy. I found a world junior bet. The relegation series has already begun. We know that Latvia already beat Aust Austria 5-2 in the first game, and you can play the money line. You can bet on Latvia plus 115. That's really good value for the favorite. And I just don't see any scenario in which Latvia loses this game. The first game, the shots were 46-13. So even 5-2 was a score that didn't reflect how lopsided it was. And just if you look at the way the tournament has flowed. So Latvia was winless in the round robin, yes, but there was a shootout loss. Every game, the margin was three goals or fewer, whereas Austria lost three different times by nine or more goals. They're just not even on the same plane as Latvia. So the fact that you can actually place a bet at plus 115 on Latvia, to me, is just like, here you are. Would you like some money? Yes, I would. I'll place this bet. And I think other people should too. So what do you think of that, Mr. Ellis? Well, first, I'll, I'll add some extra context. So Austria was actually winning that last game in the relegation, but they were getting pretty outplayed. It was just a couple of like really good bounces for Austria. Austria's first shot of the third period in that game, I believe, was 17 minutes in, and it was a far shot that had no chance of being anything. And then they had a power play at the end of the game and didn't even come close to taking that shot. Actually, Latvia controlled the puck. So, yeah, this is kind of like, wow, Latvia's – going to probably win that game and Austria is probably going to go down and uh, I think the key thing here is just getting the good goaltending because that almost burned them for, for Latvia. Austria is not a good team. Now, to be fair, Austria's best player was sick in that game. Uh, David Reinbacher, a potential first round pick in this year's draft. So, 
he could go, but he, I expect he'll be in the lineup. He was sick, so we don't totally know. But if he's there in the lineup, I don't think the shot count is anywhere like it is because he has been a very good player for Austria. But I still think it's Latvia's game to lose here at this point. Okay. And if you, if anyone has a hunch on Austria, I think the money line was like plus 500, something in that range. So you could win some real nice money if, you, if you're feeling really lucky with the, with the Austria bet. Uh, let's move on to some listener questions now, Stephen. Only a couple this week. Everyone's sort of shaking off the New Year's hangover. Maybe it was watching the Winter Classic, but we did have a couple come in. So let's get to them. Well, you know, I'm actually going to throw you for a loop. And I got one just a few minutes ago, and it's related to something we've already talked about. And it is, should I trade? JT Miller, and this is from a guy named Mike. That's interesting. You know what? I And so we know, of course, Stephen is actively trying to trade JT Miller as we're in the middle of this show. I see the situation a little differently. Uh, I actually wonder if JT Miller is a buy low. I really don't like the way he's behaved as a human being in real life and just the way he's coming across. I've heard lots of rumors that he's not very well liked in that dressing room. I could go on for a long time. But to me, that all creates a buying opportunity. And again, I say this as someone who's a major villain persona in his own league. So I'm a shark. And if something in real life is making people change the way they understand JT Miller and view him, I want, I'm going to use that bias against people. And I think he's someone you can buy low, you can get for less. And he is, even in having a down year, he's just a contributor to many different categories, right? He gives you a lot of shots, hits, points, even in a down year. So I think now you can maybe get him for 75 cents on the dollar. And I would be looking to buy JT Miller, not trade. Okay, I like that one. Uh, this one comes from Chicago Wants CB, and uh, they have a picture of Connor Bedard. So that's what I'm going to guess CB stands for. Seth Jones is typically a good fantasy bet, but he's on pace to have nearly half the points he did a year ago. Do you think he can bounce back? No, I don't. I think actually the situation could get much worse for him during this season because look at all the players on the team that are important contributors that might get traded. Patrick Kane, Jonathan Taves, Max Domi, Andres Athanasiu. If all those guys are gone in a couple months, then Seth Jones has literally no one to pass the puck to. His numbers are already really depressed, just like everyone else in that team, but it actually could get much weaker. And we know there's no chance of Seth Jones escaping that situation. He has seven years left at $9.5 million. The contract is buyout proof. He's not going anywhere. He just has to sit there and take it. It's, it's hard You kind of feel for him. He was hoping to be leaving Columbus for a much better situation. And now it looks like he's in an even worse situation than Columbus is in. I still think if your league doesn't punish for plus minus and you do award points for shots, blocks, maybe a little bit of hits too, he can help you as a deep league contributor, some depth, but that's it. The offense is not coming back, I think at least until next season. Seth, other than that like one little run by the Blue Jackets in the playoffs, Seth Jones, I kind of feel bad, has always played on bad teams. <laughs> He has, yeah. It's 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 been a strange career legacy for someone who had such enormous potential, was sort of creeping into the Norris Trophy discussion, and just hasn't quite been able to get over the hump. And now, I don't know what's going to happen to him over the next several years because he's just sort of in hockey hell. I think is the best way to put it. He can generate a lot of offense, and that's been one of his big things in his career. But if he has no one to generate the offense with, it doesn't really matter. So, next question comes from Peter Maxon, uh, and he asks. Joe Pavelski continues to produce. Do you think he still has another good year left in him after that new deal? Yeah, what, are, what an interesting career it's been for Joe Pavelski. It's sort of reminding me of Ray Whitney, where it's, yeah. it's, oh, a, yeah. it's, you know, it's yeah. a smart, classy player, a good leader, who just because he has such a good brain on him ends up having a lot of good seasons as he's near the end of his career in his late 30s, still effective almost into his 40s. And also Joe Pavelski, not a very big guy. Ray Whitney, not a very big guy. Sometimes these smaller players are more durable it's like the bigger they are, the harder they fall. When you're smaller, you don't, you're not as prone to as many nicks and scratches, and it just seems like these guys are more durable. So I do think he has another good year left in him, especially just because of his situation. He has tremendous chemistry with Jason Robertson and Rupe Hints. So I do expect Pavelski to be a player who's going to get close to a point per game even next season. Uh, so I would still be willing to draft him in a redraft league. I think if it comes down to keeper league, that's tough. If you're choosing between Pavelski and another younger player, there is some risk because we do know eventually one of these years, the bottom will fall out. It has to happen. It eventually happened to Ray Whitney. It even happened to Armour Yager. So in his age 39 season, there's going to be some risk for sure. Uh, that's why I prefer him as a redraft. I think he's riskier if you're keeping him over another good young player. 
All right, that's it for the questions. It is time for starting lineup. And last week, you asked me about my favorite World Junior players. Connor Bedard might have to be added to that list now, but we're going to go to a non-hockey topic for this one, and it is your top six movies of 2022. Okay, and I haven't seen every major release yet because, of course, there are a lot of movies that come out at the very end of the year that are trying to win those Oscars, and they're still technically 2022. So movies like The Fablemans, for example, I haven't seen them all yet, but I, I will. Um, but I, I like my list. A few honorable mentions. RRR is really awesome. It's just bananas. If you like Mad Max, it's it's like the international version. It's just crazy. Uh, Violent Night, really fun Christmas movie with Hopper from Stranger Things. X, good horror movie. Bros, really smart, fun comedy. Banishes of Inishirin, I think that's going to be a big Oscar contender. Very depressing, but very quirky and interesting black comedy. You got The Northman, which is just a bonkers Viking saga. Avatar 2 was an entertaining movie. I liked it better than the first. It was less predictable. Those are the honorable mentions. We'll start at the bottom. Number six, Turning Red, one of the best kids' movies oh, I've yeah. seen in a long time. It, it really struck a nostalgic chord for me as well because it's set in the early 2000s when boy bands are blowing up. That was my time. I was a teenager in the early 2000s, so it really hit close to home. It's also set in Toronto. So on many different levels, it felt special. And my daughter, of course, recognizing things she sees from around the city, was really excited to watch it. Number five, a bit of a sleeper, Emily the Criminal. I'm a big Aubrey Plaza fan. I've never seen her do this kind of movie where she's in a serious role and kind of a badass as well taking on a role of someone who's really rough around the edges after playing a lot of sort of posh characters. Have you seen White Lotus or Parks and Rec? So it was a fun departure for her. Number four, everything, everywhere, all at once. A really just visually stunning and fascinating and crazy movie about multiverses. I think maybe slightly overrated. People just gush over it. I really did enjoy it. It's one of the most interesting movies I've seen in a long time. Michelle Yeoh is amazing. And Jamie Lee Curtis, I've never seen her have more fun in a movie. So it's absolutely worth a watch. It's really out there. Number three, Barbarian, a really creative and fun, darkly fun horror movie. Extremely, extremely suspenseful. I watched it sort of with a coat over my eyes when I went to see it in the theater. It was a great theater experience. Uh, so I don't want to give away too much. It's one of those movies, the less you know, the better. It's something that takes a turn that you never expect. Number two, The Batman. I think not necessarily the greatest Batman movie ever made, but I think maybe the ba the greatest Batman portrayal in terms of Batman in the costume. I think Robert Pattinson is the best, scariest, most goth and just kind of creepy Batman that I've seen. And really, when you think about who Batman is, that's who he would be as a person if he was portrayed realistically. And I just love seeing Batman and Gordon work a case like it was the movie Seven for three hours. That was just really, it really scratched me where I itch. Number one, Top Gun Maverick. I can't remember the last time a major blockbuster was this big of a home run. And I think it's an important movie because we've seen Marvel sort of taking over the theater scape and a lot of studios are afraid to release anything that's not a comic book movie anymore. But Top Gun was an original story, a sequel to original story, and it brought people back to the movie theater that weren't really going anymore. Because if you're not a comic book fan, there was, wasn't really much to see. And the aerial stunts were unbelievable. Actually, a really good performance by Tom Cruise. Great chemistry with Jennifer Connelly. So much to like there. It's probably my favorite major studio movie of the last four or five years. So and that's I, I don't watch starting lineup for you. I don't watch a ton of movies, but Turning Red, I thought that was a great movie. It's great that also the city of Toronto built like a whole stadium based off the movie. That's really cool. Um, I it was a kind of an interesting concept where they went back to the 2000s for some reason, but like it was pretty cool. Um, then uh, Batman, I love that. I kept thinking that was last year, but that was an incredible movie. Still prefer Spider Man No Way Home, sorry. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, Emily and uh, Emily the Criminal. At first, I heard that title, I'm like, oh, is this just like a, a dark t version of Emily in Paris? No, that was a terrible joke. Uh, but Emily <laughs> uh, the Criminal is actually fantastic movie and again i don't watch a ton but i just watched the glass onion movie the knives out movie it's pretty damn good yeah i didn't mind glass onion i thought it was okay very polarizing i don't think it was amazing but i i think it, it had its moments it had a great cast i really like daniel craig as benoit blanc i think he's the best part of it and i do think knives out is actually one of the most overrated movies of, of the last i don't know decade um, i've never seen it so i don't know yeah, it's good. It just, I always say it's its the thriller without twists. It has reveals, not twists. You sort of know who did it. It's so obvious. So I think it's overrated, but I still enjoy Glass Onion as well. Just not as, maybe not as much as Knives Out. It's still more of a tighter movie, but I don't think it was an amazing movie. But that's the list for 2022, at least based on what I've seen so far. And that is the end of this week's episode, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your JT Miller insights as well. Thank you to Brock Sagan for coming on the show. Thank you to ProLine Plus, and we'll be back next week.
escape Things that I know that I've done